This podcast is funded by Ted Dintersmith, the executive producer of the acclaimed film Most Likely to Succeed, and the author of the best-selling book What School Could Be. I'm Josh Rapoon, and this is the What School Could Be in Hawaii podcast. My thanks to you, series listeners. You are in 40 countries, and you have supported this podcast in ways I could not have dreamed of more than a year ago. Thank you for listening to our stories of education innovation and imagination and creativity from across the Hawaiian Islands. We promise to keep delivering professional development in your pocket, even in the middle of a pandemic. In the last episode, I talked with Kavika Kekoa Pegram, an amazing Hawaii high school graduate who is marching for social justice and climate change. My guest today is Janica Breslin in an episode I am calling my Teach for America special. This is a partnership with Jill Baldemore, the executive director of Teach for America Hawaii. When I offered Jill the opportunity to name a TFA Hawaii alum to be on this podcast, after some consideration, she named Janica Breslin. There have been many TFA alums as guests on this podcast, but none specifically named by TFA Hawaii's top brass, which is way cool. Janica is a middle school language arts teacher at Konawaina Middle School on Hawaii Island. She was a 2009 Teach for America Corps member, which would make this her 12th year in education. Janica was in the same cohort year as Justin Brown, who I interviewed on this podcast for season one. TFA Hawaii Executive Director Jill Baldemore said the following about her pick for this episode, and I quote, Janica is a humble local girl, a public school graduate of Farrington High School, and not as well known, but definitely a bright light in her approach and leadership, which has been especially apparent during COVID. She was one of the first teachers to proactively stand up informal teacher collaboration groups to share best practices in distance learning, and she's helped her school a bunch in the transition. And now, here's my conversation with Janica Breslin. Janica, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So, Janica, I'm just going to throw a bunch of questions at you and you just knock them out of the park and we'll have some fun with this. So here, here's the first question. Um, I want to start by talking about Walter Baxa, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, who is as much a hero as anyone I've come across during this pandemic and during all of the research that I do for this podcast. Um, Walter, who is a family support Hawaii IT guy, created in May of this year a program in West Hawaii Island that crowdsourced technology into the hands of kids and families who had to shelter in place and do distance learning. And you were right. one of the teachers who nominated a student to get a computer, and I'm sure much more. So I wanted to start by having you tell us the story of Walter and your student. Like, what was this all about? Sure. So I found Walter, his organization or the, the nonprofit that he started is Techie for the Cakey. I found them through social media and I learned that um, on his free time, Walter um, gets computers donated from the community and he refurbishes them and he sets the right, um, like it, he changes the, the computers so that they will run the programs that are run by the schools. Um, so that students can have, students who don't have access to computers, uh, they can have a device to use at home for free. Um, so he asks community, mem community members or he prioritizes teachers to nominate students uh, via the Techie for the Cakey social media site. And then he gets in touch with the teachers and then they work out like um, a time and when to meet, meet the students, uh, get the devices from him to the students. Um, so 
the students that I was thinking of the, uh, that I nominated to him um, are students who, you know, one of them live off grid uh, and they don't have steady internet, but they do have. And they're really a part of this. They come to school as a part of, uh, to be part of uh, a bigger unit. And so like during the pandemic, when they don't have internet access, they don't have, or they're not allowed to go anywhere. Um, they really lose that connection. So it was very vital to make sure that that, that connection is steady. Um, in addition to keeping up with academics. Um, so there's another student who, um, who is very much interested in, uh, in technology and computers, and, but he didn't have his own devices. Uh, so he got a device that let him finish school or let him finish assignments at school, but also he was able like to toy with and pursue his passion a little bit more. Wow. So those are the two students that I nominated. Um, and Walter Boxa also um, had connected with other teachers from our school, but also like he really connected with a lot of uh, individuals, mm. both teachers and uh, non-educators in our community. Mm. You know, what really strikes me, Janica, about this story is that we, we talk a lot about equity and access. And I think a lot of that conversation, it, it sort of revolves around the idea that it's not my problem, right? This is a, this is a problem that the Department of Education or, you know, whoever the institution is, it's supposed to be the institution or even right. government, right? And, and what strikes me about this story is this is the real people on the ground who understand the equity issue and they, they want to solve it. They work to solve it. Right. Uh, yeah. What, what are your thoughts about that? One of the most beautiful things about Walter Boxa and Techie for the Kiki and everyone um, who's involved in it or has gotten involved in it is they do it because they can. That's what Mr. Boxa said. Like he had like an interview with West Hawaii Today and that's what he said. He He's helping out because there's a need and he is he has this ability to help out and fill that gap, right? Um, and I think that that is a beautiful thing that education is really the, it's on the shoulders of the entire community. Right. You know, and, and he then inspired other people to get involved. So then there's more people, there's more hands in it. And we, there's even people that reached out to like bigger organizations, like uh, the local office depot or, Mm -hmm. And said, hey, do you have any things to throw away? Because then we can actually make use of it. So part of the, the, the beauty in that is that um, it was infectious. It was infectious. It was, mm -hmm. um, it was something that people rallied with him. Mm-hmm. And, you know, this, the last episode that I did was with a young man, a Waipahu High School graduate who is deep into the equity issue. And he's been uh, doing a lot of marches around social justice and, the, and climate change and so on and so forth. And part of that conversation, Janica, was about how, you know, the goodness in people comes out when they realize mm -hmm. that they can do something for their community. It comes, it comes out naturally. And there's just so many people out there. There are so many stories out there across Hawaii where people in the pandemic responded with these sort of local grassroots uh, um, networks, if you will, that were put together so that, uh, you know, certain problems could be addressed. And I just love that, that you shared that with me. And um, it was a very inspiring beginning uh, to my research about you. So um, it was, it's just really cool. And I, I wanted to highlight that story right out of, right out of the gate here. Um, so I want to, I want to shift just slightly. I want to ask you about your time over two years, writing and editing articles for a magazine called Poetic Couture, which mm -hmm. I found totally fascinating. Um, I spent some time surfing their website and Facebook pages, and I want to read a description from their website. Um, 
It goes like this. Poetic Couture is the new global initiative for social change. We unite creative thinkers in the fashion and entertainment industry with a unified philanthropic purpose. With a firm belief in the power of social change, we can make a difference. So my question is, what is, what is the difference that Poetic Couture wants to make? And what types of articles did you write and edit for mm-hmm. them? Sure. Um, so Poetic Couture, what they wanted to accomplish is like, you know, social justice, um, positive change in the community, but through um, the lens of like working people or people who are working at the Humane Society or this lady who's b- battling cancer. Um, and also like the, uh, with the help of the arts. So there's a lot of like collaboration between the people that, um, that the journalists were interviewing and um, fashionistas and artists and photographers. So there's collaboration between all those people and they hope to bring awareness to certain uh, issues and they, they hope to mobilize people to be inspired and to take action um, towards positive change. When I wrote articles, um, I was asked to interview certain people. And as a writer, one of my jobs was, or what I thought what I, what I wanted to accomplish is to bring out the humanity in those people. Mm-hmm. Um, or like bring out the beauty in the things that might not necessarily like when you look at it at the first glance, you don't see it as beauty, but there is something about it that is inspiring. And we, we need to take notice of it and be empowered by it. Mm -hmm. So for example, um, one particular, um, subject that I was asked to, to interview is, um, uh, a lady who was a nurse during World War II. And she met who at the time she felt like was the love of her life during World War II, who was a soldier. And then the war and then life had brought them apart and they hadn't seen each other. So they like pursued other love interests, which are true and honest and very, very, very strong in love uh, in them. But then after their partners have died, their grandkids are older, they still like remembered each other and they found each other in like their, um, the last few years of their lives and they got to reconnect again. Uh, And it's, you know, it's like, we don't really think about like what life is like when you're an elderly person or like after you retire Mm -hmm. But there's beauty, what I thought, in finding your love again and finding, like, where is that that itch in the back of your heart, Mm -hmm. where that comes from. Um, So, and I wanted to uh, convey the message of life doesn't actually end. Like, it ends when... Uh, maybe you pass and I don't know what's after that, but like pursue and chase and fulfill whatever it is that you want. It It's there and it doesn't have to end at a certain point. It doesn't have to end at retirement. It doesn't have to end when, you know, like you have to settle or anything and it doesn't have to be big. It could be something small, like so that one thing that fulfills your soul fulfills your heart that could be something you pursue afterwards Mm. um so yeah so poetic culture um meshes together art humanity social change and i wanted to um like really bring out beauty in people in ways that we don't maybe normally see it as Mm. Wow. That's, that's fantastic. What was the, you know, uh, besides the interviews that you did, what was like the favorite piece that you wrote for the magazine? Um, my favorite piece 
is probably about um, um, dog tails. So there's this um, lady who, you know, she loves animals and she has worked at the shelter and she wanted to help save animals who are being euthanized. And so what she did is she worked with Poetic Culture to have like this um, um, photo shoot, like professional photo shoot, everything so nice to make those dogs that are at the end of the list um, look like models, basically. And then they published a book or a catalog of those photographs. And then they got adopted because they were, you know, like presented in this positive light. Wow. And I just thought like, that's a superhero. <laughs> it sure is. And we don't even hear about it. So like, <laughs> we've got to read about those stories. We've got to read about those people. Um, and I like that piece a lot because of um, Danielle. She's so great. Mm. Um, but also that... It is one of the pieces that I shared with my students at that time. And I wanted to let my students know that writing has power mm. and that writing brings out beauty, that writing um, helps shape people's minds and that I was, you know, like I'm not BSing them. Like I am trying to teach you guys literacy, reading and writing and I, I can provide you an example, like for me, like I, mm -hmm. I know my material and I can help you get better at it as a professional, like reader, writer. Mm. You know, that's a perfect segue to my next question. Um, because the next question is, I wanted to talk about words, about poetic words, mm -hmm. about biographic words, fictional words. And after reading a piece you wrote about your identity and in, in um, poetic Couture, I got to thinking about how educators uh, who have a way with words, as you so clearly do, um, help their students, in your case, middle school students, achieve the same mastery of words. So I know that this is a really big question, Jenica, I know, but from what place do you start as you begin your journey to bring kids to mastery of words? How do you do that? Where do you start from? I start with vulnerability. I think the, the times when I see greatest success is when I start with vulnerability. And what I mean by that is I am showing my students that we are not aiming for perfection and I am certainly not. And some of the pieces that we're gonna write in class um, lean towards like professional for outside audiences. And then some of them are personal. And I always, either or, I present them with my own work to show that either this is what I'm envisioning for you, but also like this is what trial and error might look like. Mm -hmm. And I just... Um, I start with like, let's bring your guard down and we're on the same page. And I am not like here to evaluate your character. We are working together to build skill. Mm. Mm -hmm. So it's so funny because I was actually, you know, gonna go there about the, the vulnerability thing. I'm gonna do that in a second. Um, let's take a minute to reintroduce you uh, to our audience. Janica Breslin, a writer and poet and language arts teacher at Kona Waina Middle School on Hawaii Island is our guest today. So Janica, you know, clearly from your writing, and I, I referenced specifically a piece you wrote in um, for hawaiistories.com titled What Others Don't See, um, which was absolutely a fabulous piece to read. You are keenly aware of the personal impact of making yourself vulnerable to others in public spaces. Um, and so my question is about 
your students and the ways being vulnerable is part of your philosophy of education. So what is that value? How do you help your students build confidence, find their voices, lay out their vulnerabilities? You, you've talked about it a little bit, but like, what are, what are literally some of the exercises that you do to begin that process and to develop that process? Um, one of the things that I do to help my, or to encourage my students to be vulnerable with me is that when I talk to them about like expectations and where they can move, you know, like to and fro in those expectations, when we talk about like, what does novice look like? Hmm. The way that I explain novice is that I, as a teacher, did not do a good enough job for you to understand or be able to perform something. And I think that that takes away a lot of pressure on them and they're willing to engage with me a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that partly it's because like they don't feel like... Um, that making mistakes is a bad thing or that it's their fault, that it's part of the process. And I also, I'm part of that process. I am growing with them along the way. Mm. You know, I'm not teaching. Teaching is not like a one-way street. Teaching is this really non-linear process for both the teachers and the students. Mm. And then I also... When we do presentations um, or some sort of sharing, there are times when the students can choose a right to pass. If they are not quite comfortable yet, mm -hmm. then we can think about other ways where they can present in a different way or that how, um, how we can build the audience from like one-on-one -on -one with me to the next step instead of like diving in and, and just like tanking. Um, so part of it is reassuring students that I'm going to stay with them along the way and that it is okay to take baby steps with me. Mm -hmm. So it seems like the key part here is you're not judging them, you're growing with them. Absolutely. Wow. And so, yeah, go ahead. Um, I also wanted to say that, um, you know, like at the end of a quarter or the end of something always comes and then there's some sort of yeah. grade, right? Grade. Right. Um, so this school year, I've kind of approached that a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. And I'm only, I've only proposed it to students who want to do this with me. So I can't necessarily say like how far the impact is. But with the students who chose to do it with me, um, I'll let you know how it went. So what I decided to do is um, I made a document that says, this is what you got for this assignment, this assignment, and this is how it led to this assessment at the end of the quarter. Mm -hmm. And then I did that for like a reading and writing. Uh, this quarter, they're probably, they're going to have a reading, writing, and speaking. And then... At the end of that document, what I wanted to end with is some of my observations on them and my hopes for them. Mm, wow. So for this, and I asked them, like, if you would like to do this with me, um, let's do it outside of classroom because I want to do a one-on-one -on -one conference with you. I want to, like, tell you to your face, looking at your eyes through hook screen, mm -hmm. um, what I what I'm learning from you, basically. So, and that throws students off, you know, like they're like, wait, if we're not going to talk about the grades, like we're not going to end with the grades. Yeah. And, and then they end up with, wow, someone sees me mm. and they see my, my journey, not just like, the end of the quarter, what I got on this. Um, and I think that is very, very important. We need to recognize what it's like for students who have gone through whatever unit we're going through, you know, not just necessarily 
um, the final outcome. Mm -hmm. And we need to take the time to do that one-on-one so that they, they know that you are talking to them at their level yeah, or that we're talking as person to person, not that I'm talking down to them. Mm. So for the students that had chosen to do that conference with me, um, we all ended with just like this, like breath (laughs) of relief, right? right? Of, okay, so there's these strengths and these areas of weaknesses, but wow, I do feel good. And I hope that next quarter is going to be so much better. Mm. Um, or I'm going to like, I'm going to keep up the great work. And I'm so happy that I stuck through it to, through all the ups and downs. And I can imagine that they would then go hang out with their peers and they would say, you know what, this was a really cool process. You should elect to do it next time. It's really wonderful, right? I mean, it almost markets itself amongst the the students' peers. Right. Wow. That's just so, all right. I, I, Jenica, I've read a lot of what you've written um, as much as I could and as much as I had time for. And I I want all children to write like you, to express thoughts and feelings like you. I'll just put that out there. But of course, that is not possible. But just kind of pulling up to the like 30,000 foot level, how do we how do we at least give all kids a chance to be a writer and thinker? in the way that you've become a writer and thinker, like just thinking globally, what do we Mm -hmm. have to do in order to give every kid a chance to have an experience like what you're talking about right now? Okay. (laughs) Um, When I first came to this country, I didn't know a lick of English. And, but I had teachers who did not let my language barrier stop what they think of me or what I think of myself. And I got challenged to, even though like my writing isn't perfect or my speaking isn't perfect, to go for the honors classes, to go to this health academy and go for uh, an honors um, something else. And so from that, we need to make sure that we believe that all students can learn. Mm -hmm. And I think that every teacher comes to this profession with that belief, but we have to always calibrate ourselves every single day to see if our actions, if our words really show that because the students will know if you believe it or not. Yeah. Um, So that's one thing, you know, believe in the students and make sure that belief comes through every single day. Um, The second thing is what I'm noticing from um, like the students when we do like really difficult writing assignments is um, I'm the type of person, I'm so type A and so detail oriented that I get really caught up in the small little errors and I lose sight of like, but the big picture. And so I have to tell myself, um, aim big and those small things, they'll catch on. Mm. So I could spend like day after day working on spelling um, and grammar, which in itself is not bad. Um, But I'm learning that when we talk about big ideas, when we talk about complexity or why this shows that why how then all the smaller skills get pushed up along Mm -hmm. the way right so the second thing that i i that we need to do to push students to be better thinkers better writers is think big don't be afraid of the small things that they cannot do you know we we often operate with like this um Let's start off with a deficit mindset, you know, like, yeah. what do they, what do they not learn instead of like, what could they do? Right. And let's, let's get there. Um, so think big and, and pursue big goals, mm. pursue big goals that the students want to pursue. 
That's, and the little things will catch on. That's, you know, that's so cool. Um, I, I wanted to share with you that um, back when I was teaching at the time, I was at La Pietra, Hawaii School for Girls. Um, mm-hmm. I was blessed to have relatively small class sizes. Um, there was a there was a technology moment where mobile devices were coming into play. And I discovered um, sort of a switch in the way that I was delivering progress reports or comments to my kids. So you know how when you write comments, it's always like you're writing to the parent. Like, you know, mm-hmm. John John is having trouble with commas. John is having trouble, right. you know, with his syntax or whatever. And I, I switched my voice to John. And so I started dictating verbally my comments to John, for example. And I would say, you know, like, John, like, you are so mastering the big picture right now, you know? And I would go on a little riff about that. And then mm-hmm. eventually I would come around to, you know, the opportunity in front of you is to begin to craft your writing in such a way that you really shine in terms of the big picture. And that was such a liberating moment for me as a teacher. Yeah. It was like I didn't have to write to the parents anymore. And the parents were sort of pushed a little bit to the side so that I could have a one-on-one relationship with the kid. It was it was quite cool. And I think that's what you're talking about here. Yeah, and I bet that John and all the other students who, who went through that with you um, feels validated. Mm-hmm. You know, like that my strengths are being noticed, not necessarily like all the, the, the negatives, you know? Right. The deficits that somehow right. we perceive as they come out of the gate. Right. 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 So, okay. So slight variation on this question. I was really knocked out, Janica, by your Ho'okipa Writers Project, um, mm-hmm. which is relatively new, right? This was something you put into place um, during the pandemic. Um, on Facebook. It's a Facebook page. Um, So why did you create it? And in what ways has it become a resource to other educators? Sure. Um, So I had created it um, a little bit before the pandemic. I want to say like Mm. two years ago, I think. Oh, okay. And I wanted to have an audience for my students in a way that is familiar to them. So I know like I'm very social media shy. I only have Facebook and then all the other ones are very foreign to me. Mm -hmm. But I know that my students use and their parents use social media. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to create a space where if parents cannot come to school and join us on our um, parent night or our uh, student showcase, that there's still a place for them to look at, oh, hey, this is what my eighth grader is doing. Um, So that's how it started out as. And then um, in the, in over time, um, it has kind of evolved into um, not just showcasing uh, necessarily like best work, but also like strategies for teachers to look at. Because I noticed that other colleagues and other teachers from other places are also looking into it. Um, and then also a place where, um, I can reference and see, oh, I remember that particular unit had gone well. Let me see what I can do with it this new, uh, second time around. Mm -hmm. So it's really, it has become like a community resource, um, but also a resource for me, um, as a teacher and an educator. Mm. Yeah, that's that's fabulous. I I spent a lot of time this morning just kind of scrolling through the pages. You're going to see all my likes there. I was liking every single post that you put up there, and I did. <laughs> Thank li- you. I linked it, by the way, to another Facebook page. I I posted about it um, at Leading Schools to the Future on Facebook. That's a page that I manage. Um, so I really I, appreciate that. Thank yeah, you so much. I mean, people people should know about these resources because we're we're very much in a frame of mind here in Hawaii during the pandemic of, you know, reach across the aisle and see what somebody needs or look look at this resource that's out here. In what ways can I use it? Um, I, I, I feel really good about some of the things that are happening in the state in that regard. Um, so I, I want to, one more question and then we'll take a little break. I want to talk about failure. And, and this may seem like sort of a weirdly constructed question, but roll with me mm-hmm. on it. Um, in your letters from an unqualified mother, uh, written for Yellow Arrow Publishing, which is a creative nonfiction journal by female identifying writers, 
you wrote a series of astonishing letters to your son that reflect, mm -hmm. you know, really deeply on perceived failure. So I know this might seem strange, but given the fact that you recently rewatched the documentary film Most Likely to Succeed, right? Um, mm -hmm. I wonder if you could share your thoughts about Brian, who, for those who have seen the kid and, uh, sorry, seen the film, most people have, mm -hmm. that he's, Brian is the kid in the film who fails his teammates by getting in the way of finishing a project in time for public exhibition night, but right. works, wor works through the summer to get the project done. Some say heroically, you know, by himself. So I wonder what your thoughts are about the way that he's portrayed and, and about that process of learning from failure. Sure. So in, in a traditional setting, right, when there's the cutoff uh, or the deadline, he would be that student that fails. And then we are going to talk about, like, why he failed. Um, but... In high tech high, he spent like four more weeks after the deadline to finish. And it was grueling. Like you can hear it in um, whenever they interviewed him, like before the exhibition night and then after it's he's in pain <laughs> and he knows where his 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 flaws are. And yet like. And yet, it was almost like he was taking it all as vitamins and strengthening him. Mm. You know, it's, it's failure in one sense, but also like this like spinach for Popeye. And he's Popeye. It just mm. took a little longer than the other kids. And so things that I'm learning from Brian is students they all learn at different paces. And if we are like so concrete about the deadline, then what are we, what message are we giving them about the learning process that it stops? Um, but that if we give them the opportunity to reflect and keep making mistakes without judgment, they're going to feel empowered to finish the product or get through it even after the deadline and to just to, to, to come through that entire, to go through the entire journey instead of giving up, you know? Um, and then the other thing that I took away from the film is um, at one of the times when they were reflecting, um, one of his teachers had said, Brian, you are a visionary. And that's beautiful because he is. But if, like, if we had kept looking only at what Brian was um, failing or what he was not doing or not um, completing, then we would have missed this beautiful thing about him, which is that he is a complex thinker. He is a visionary and he wants like big dreams to come to reality. And we need that kind of skill, that kind of passion in our society. So that's mm -hmm. failure we need to reimagine or redefine what that is because right now there's a stigma on it. Yeah. Um, but also like revise the, the tone that we use when we talk about failure mm. mm -hmm. because we often are talking about it like a, it's a final thing. Mm. You failed to do this and it's now done. Good luck on the next thing. Mm, right, right. So, okay. Having said that, though, I want to put you a little bit on the spot with a with a sort of hypothetical that's not quite a hypothetical. Let's sure. say that you're sort of the dean of you know of 
curricular studies at High Tech High. And there are a group of parents and their kids that want to meet with you, private meeting. Um, and these are the kids that were on Brian's team. And they're pretty upset about the way that he was portrayed in the film, that he finished it on his own, that there's sort of a heroic quality um, to him. And yet they didn't get to finish because of the way that Brian procrastinated and led his team. So what are your thoughts to them, this group of people, these parents and these kids in front of you? Um, I would first maybe ask them clarifying questions on what they feel like um, was lost in that experience. Mm -hmm. And I want to help or give them guiding questions on what are all of the kids learning from that situation. Right. And how those learnings, those, um, those in the, in a, in the in documentary called it soft skills, which is ironic to me because I feel like the soft skills are really hard skills. Yeah, right? they're essential they're, skills. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. Um, and how that's going to help them in their adult life, mm -hmm. you know, um, so I would want to ask them to um, have a conversation with me about the journey that everyone had experienced. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and well said. And, and in fact, that's what life is like, right? I mean, we, we, the 21st century and beyond is going to be about working in teams. And so mm -hmm. how do you get better at working at teams if you never have an experience like what those kids had, which is the team leader who really led you astray? That's reality. Right. That's what's going to happen in the real world. Um, and, and I think you've, you've put your thumb on it, which is you ask, you know, clarifying questions and then you try to get them to think about what did you learn out of this particular moment that makes you a better teammate or a better player as you go forward in time. Right. Yeah, that's a that's a it's such a complex moment. And in fact, I said that it was sort of a hypothetical. That's not a hypothetical that actually happened. Um, Ted has Ted Dintersmith, the executive producer, has shared stories with me about how upset the kids uh, who were on Brian's team were. And that, in fact, yeah. they, they wanted to get them on film, but they couldn't because they refused. Um, and oh. so it just, it becomes this strange sort of interesting <laughs> drama, this like Greek tragedy comedy kind of thing, um, which has got tons of learning all the way through it. It's, it's very, yeah. very interesting. Yeah. So, hey everybody, stay with us. After this short break, we will come back with more questions for Janica Breslin. Stay with us. This is Guy Kawasaki. If you want to learn how to be a remarkable person, please check out my podcast, Remarkable People. I interview people like Roy Yamaguchi, Margaret Atwood, Jane Goodall, Stephen Wolfram, Stephen Pinker, Ariana Huffington, and Steve Wozniak. The point of the podcast is to help you become a little bit more remarkable. To learn more, go to remarkablepeople.com. Thank you. Hawaii's business people and professionals want to support our public high school students across the state, like me, Law Yagovich, a senior at Kuku High School. And Hawaii's teachers and other educators want classroom speakers, curriculum advice, contest judges, mentors, and other support from businesses and nonprofits. The Climb High Bridge is Hawaii Department of Education's official platform to connect the two communities. It's like Match.com, specifically designed to connect businesses and schools. Learn more by sending an email to info at climbhigh.org. That's spelled C-L-I-M-B-H-I dot org. Hi, friends. Toy Hirschman here from the Entre Ed Talk podcast. I am super excited to support the What School Could Be in Hawaii podcast hosted by none other than the amazing Josh Rapoon. And I also want to give a big shout out to all of the incredible educators in Hawaii who are doing unreal things in the entrepreneurship and design-based thinking spaces. I hope you all subscribe and listen to What School Could Be in Hawaii. And also, hey, 
why not check out the EntreEd Talk podcast where we interview stellar entrepreneurial educators and entrepreneurs from across the country and globe. I cannot wait to connect with you. Farmers Insurance Hawaii and the Public Schools of Hawaii Foundation are excited to announce the winners of the Education Innovation Teacher Challenge. Tyler Gage of Chiefas Kamakahele Middle School and Wesley Atkins of James Campbell High School are this year's winners, each receiving a $25,000 grant to implement their innovative learning programs. We look forward to seeing their ideas come to life. Farmers Hawaii sends a big mahalo to all teachers for the work they do that extends far beyond the classroom walls. To learn more, visit FarmersHawaii.com slash Education Innovation. Hey everybody, my name is Josh Rapoon and this is the What School Could Be in Hawaii podcast. Today we are with Janica Breslin, a graduate of Farrington High School and the Teach for America program and a middle school teacher a language arts teacher at Konawaina Middle School on Hawaii Island. So Janica, because this is a Teach for America special podcast edition, I want to talk about your time with Teach for America Hawaii, your experience with that cohort. You were in a TFA cohort from 2009 to 2011. So right. what is TFA all about? And what was your experience in the cohort? And in what ways does TFA Hawaii continue to support your work as you move forward as an educator? Sure. So Teach for America is a program um, that um, brings newly graduates into the education field. Um, And they spend a summer, kind of like military camp, Uh, learning about teaching and then for two years they're enrolled in a um, a certificate course or a master's program but also working full-time at a school with high need Um, and I was part of the 2009 core here on Big Island and uh, interestingly enough um, I applied for TFA hoping to get out of Hawaii and then they said, welcome to Hawaii, <laughs> okay. right. um, which is totally fine because life kind of like uh, happened for me here. And it, it, it started with TFA. So after Summer Institute or before Summer Institute, there's a group of us that got pulled aside and said, hey, so we're going to start a core on the big island and you guys are it. And we're like, Yay! What is the Big Island like? I, I don't have family here, so I didn't have any prior knowledge or experience here on the Big Island. And um, then afterwards, a couple of uh, my friends and I, we became roommates. And then I got a job at Konawana Middle School. Mm-hmm. And Teach for America, my experience in it, at that time, um, I'm sure everyone who says this about the program, it's like the hardest thing you ever go through in that two years that you're there. And, and at that time, it felt like, you know, like data process, fill out your data tracker. Um, let's talk about lesson planning and RTI. And it's, and it's hard work. It's just hard work. And, but... TFA provides you with like your family. So like I went through the hard work. I went through like late nights and I went through crying days with my cohort and the, um, our, uh, MTLDs. And I'm not sure if it's like called those now, but our coaches from TFA, uh, they're the ones who like cry through <laughs> the process with us. Mm-hmm. Um, so I feel like, all in all, it's a really rigorous program. It, it, it teaches you like these hard skills in teaching and they help problem solve you. Um, but they also are, are the ones that are going to make you feel like family through the whole thing. Um, and afterwards, that's true still. Like for my experience, they stay connected with you afterwards. They check in on you. They, you know, like they say, Hey, I found this that you worked on. I think you'd like it. So they mail it back to me. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I was so young and naive and also like 
pretty awesome because I was imaginary <laughs> and visionary. <laughs> this is awesome. Right. Um, so they, you know, they, they keep up with you. They empower you through your endeavors. And then they also, when you uh, want it, they also give you um, more information in, about opportunities that you might be interested in. So from TFA, I learned about the Emerging Learn. Uh, emerging teachers program and then I got to uh, emerging uh, leaders program and I got to do that with their help um, and then I got connected with ESET and those um, really awesome conferences and so yeah it's just mm-hmm. basically like this this family that you have and they stay with you mm. it sounds a lot like the kind of relationship that you would hope a student would have with a teacher um, that you grow together in this process. Is that a fair, right. fair statement? Yes, it is. Mm. And um, here's another thing that I, um, I really like about TFA, especially now that I'm an alumni, is that they also take interest in you as a person. So like I could share some, like one of my writings on social media and they will read it and be like, wow, that's awesome, or that I can relate to it. So I know that mm. they don't just see me as a participant or this um, part of the data analysis that they're doing on their part. Like, I am a person, and I work with them, and I also, like, um, I have a life, and they're interested in my life. Mm. Mm-hmm. That's that's very cool. Um, so slight follow up to this questioner. Um, you, you wrote to me that, and I quote, TFA Hawaii's mission uh, to close the gap, meaning the equity gap, um, really goes far beyond the classroom. I see that in their collective response to current events. I see that in the way they support core members and alums who find their own path to justice. So my question is, what, what has been TFA's collective response to the pandemic? And, and how have they supported you an alum specifically on your path to justice? Mm -hmm. Um, So their uh, response to the pandemic is, this is tough on everyone, but we are not going to let it like lessen the quality of our teaching. Mm -hmm. So um, they, they found ways, it was so magical. They found ways to turn their entire summer institute virtually so that teachers could have that preparation before the school year. Right. Um, and in a short amount of time, right, be- between March and May, they had to do this for the entire core or for the entire region, which is beautiful. Mm-hmm. Um, and they also... Um, responded to teachers' need of, hey, this is a unique experience and it's harder than ever and we are here for you. And so um, I noticed that they are, um, I joined them for one of the sessions this summer or this past summer and it was very like Mm teacher-centered, you know, like what are the things that you are um, wanting to learn more about? Let's gather the resource there. Or what questions do you have on this topic? And then they like, you know, like they flow with the needs of the teachers mm. in the institute. Mm. You know, I I observed a couple of things as the pandemic really started to lock everybody down. One was that there seemed, and no disrespect intended, but there seemed to be a lot of educators who were just sort of a little bit deer in the headlights and were looking, uh, you know, to the top tier to say, you know, here's what you have to do. Here's what you need to do. And then there were a whole, there was a whole nother sort of legion of educators who just sort of rolled up their sleeves and started talking to each other to figure it all out. And it seems like that's what you experienced with TFA this past summer was that kind of moment. Like you all just sort of figured it out. You got together, TFA helped create the superstructure for that to happen. And you all started to share resources with each other, right? Right, right. And um, and I think the message was clear that we're all gonna function as professionals mm. um, and we're all gonna function as new teachers. 
and we're going to do it together and we're going to empower ourselves and we're going to empower each other. Mm. Um, But yes, I also like saw that there were teachers that were willing to like get together and create their own PD because like no one knows how to teach in a pandemic. Like, oh my goodness. Um, But there were teachers that took it upon themselves. They, They literally like grabbed it by the horns and said, okay, maybe it's not going to be perfect, but this is what I'm going to try. And then next week, it's like, I'm going to try this new thing. So there were definitely teachers um, who had that mindset throughout the pandemic. Mm. Which furthers the idea, which I love and which I'm promoting as much as possible, uh, which is, you know, teachers are the source of innovation. That's where innovation comes from. Our individual teachers who are just rolling up their sleeves and figuring things out as they go. Um, I'm very encouraged by that. Um, and I, I, I thank you for for sharing that. And that's a great segue, Janica, to, to the next question I wanted to ask you. Um, I've, I've asked many of my podcast guests, most especially Sandy Camelli, um, about the idea of teacher leadership in our public schools. Um, and private and charter schools. So in 2011, you went through the Professional Development and Education Research Institute of our uh, Hawaii Department of Education, it's known as Padere, right? So Mm -hmm. what what is your vision of teacher leadership? This is, sorry, this is going to be a multi-part question. What's your vision (laughs) of teacher leadership? Like, how do we get all educators in Hawaii or at least the majority of educators in Hawaii to see themselves, to train themselves as teacher leaders? Like how do we get Hawaii to a place where the majority of educators see themselves as empowered leaders designing our schools of the future? I think we need to, as a bigger unit, as a system, we need to create an environment, a culture where we as teachers can function like Brian. Mm. We need we need space to have a vision, to enact that vision. Um, and we also need space for trial and error. Mm. And I think that when teachers are given that kind of space, they are more likely to take risks, to try something new, to be innovative, and to work outside of the box, work outside of the walls of the classroom. So one of the things that I've heard over and over and over again, Janica, in these episodes I've I've experienced in my research is that a a crucial issue for teachers is time. I hear it over and over Mm -hmm. and over again, right? What you're saying is there's another crucial issue, crucial issue, which is space. You want want teachers to have Mm. space to do, to try and to fail, right? Absolutely. And Um, and, yeah, what are some examples from your own teaching where, where that's actually played out? Sure. Um, so, um, one of the most successful units I've had is called Kulia, um, Kulia Ikanu Strive for the Summit. And it's basically like a multi-part project. Um, students are in groups. They choose a problem that they care about. They write a research paper for it. They do community service or ser- some sort of service learning related to that. And then they have this, um, community presentation or panel presentation where community members are invited to watch and do a Q&A with them. Mm-hmm. And that unit would not be possible if I didn't have supportive colleagues. If I didn't um, feel like I could bring community members in here or help students like go out of my classroom and learn elsewhere. Um, so we need, um, like to feel safe to take risks. If we feel like we're going to be penalized for taking risks or that we are going to, um, lose some, something, um, we are probably going to stay within the, the safety confines of like our textbooks. Right. And if you're given space... Then what happens? And then <laughs> you define you define a ceiling, or just 
lift the ceiling off of the top. Mm -hmm. And then, and then you get to, you start to iterate. You have space to iterate. You can move through and make incremental changes, evaluate them, um, reflect on them, and then either continue them or not continue them. Right? Absolutely. And let, and you're probably going to be more willing to let the students take the reins. Because if, um, if you feel safe to take the risks, um, then you're going to share that leadership with your students. Mm. And then eventually it's going to be student centered. And it's the students who will have actually driven it in that direction because you've given them the reins. And right. they're happy to pick right. up the reins and go for it, right? Especially in middle right. school. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. They have a lot of ideas. Um, we just need to pass the mic. Um, but I want to point out the fact that the student empowerment has to, like, the conversation around that has to happen alongside with the conversation around teacher empowerment. Mm. We cannot separate the two. Um, for our students to succeed, we need to create the conditions where they will succeed. And we also need to create the conditions um, where our teachers are willing to push the boundaries. It has to be like this um, simultaneous conversation and work in progress. Mm. Does that also mean, Janica, that we're going to have to, sorry, this is a bit rhetorical, but that we're going to have to reevaluate how we evaluate teacher performance if we're reevaluating how students are performing as things become more project-based, challenge-based, culture-based, place-based, experiential, then we have to figure out ways to, to determine how well our teachers are succeeding rather than just test scores or college matriculation and that sort of thing. Absolutely. Um, we need, you know, like a more comprehensive way to reflect um, both at the student level and at the teacher level um, and whatever is around the teachers. Um, we need to also, we need to encourage teachers and, and to embrace the trial and error. And that means that we need to, as a system, value that trial and error process. Mm -hmm. We need to value teachers and their experiences and their journeys. Mm. Wow. So, okay, I'm, I'm just going to seize the moment here. I'm going to ask you this follow-up question. Um, let's say that I'm your principal and we have eight weeks to go in the year and you and I sit down and we say to each other or I say to you, Janica, give me the top three things that you want to be evaluated on at the end of the year and as a teacher. And then we'll talk about those eight weeks from now. What would those top three things be? How do you want to be evaluated as a teacher? I don't know how it would be measured necessarily. Don't worry about measurements. We'll figure that sure. out. <laughs> <laughs> um, but one of the things that I would like um, my admin to know about is um, what my students feel about themselves mm. and what they can articulate about their learning and their growth from my class. Mm -hmm and that they can talk about um, like the bigger picture of literacy. Mm -hmm. You know, like, yes, there are these skills, but like in life, how has my class um, affected them on a personal level? Mm -hmm. Even if like it's a projection of the future. Um, so that's one of the things that I, I would love to be considered or 
uh, mm-hmm. for my evaluation. So for, for the next eight weeks, you and I are going to take the time to figure out how we're going to do that. If it's a survey or whatever the complexities of that process is, we'll figure it out together. That's awesome. Okay. Okay. Um, and the next thing is I would like to be, um, and I, I almost, I also want to, I'm not sure if the word evaluation is what I would like Mm, fair to, point. To bring up. Um, but I would like to have a conversation with you about the things that I wanted to try and what I did try mm. and what I learned about mm. or from them. Right. Mm-hmm. Understood. We'll figure that out as well. We'll figure out a process to determine what you wanted to do, how well it worked, and how you reflected on it, and where you're going to go from there. Right. Okay. Um, And the third thing that I would like for us to have a conversation on is, um, what next? Hmm. I, I want to tell you how I would like to grow from here and how, what I can, what I would like to bring to the table next school year. Um, and I'm hoping that my ideas would garner support and I can try even more new things. Mm -hmm. That's fabulous. We'll figure out how to have that conversation in eight weeks about where you're going to go. And I would, I would point out that that's, this is so interesting because we have not talked about any kind of numbers or anything attached to your teaching in that way. Um, In other words, you know, if a teacher doesn't have a plan for growth, that's a concern. And we'll have to talk about that because we want every teacher to grow, right? We don't want everybody to Mm -hmm. stay in the same place because the world is not staying in the same place. That's the opening 15 minutes of most likely to succeed. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Right? Um, So, you know, that's just, that's so fascinating. And what really catches me in this moment, Janica, is that, You know, and, you know, Honolulu Magazine has been horribly uh, guilty of this kind of thing of just taking a bunch of metrics and then just, you know, putting them all together and giving a grade, um, Mm -hmm. which drives me a little bonkers. But here, what you're talking about is something that's um, very, it's very like you and I as, as principal and teacher, you know, are building a relationship in the same way that you're wanting to build those kinds of relationships with your students. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. So that system starts to move forward. Um, Yeah. Like in a metaphorical sense, like um, let's talk about how we bring life into mm, the learning. Like, because learning has to be alive. What does learning look like when it's in motion and when it is in practice? Like, what does it look like with your hands and with your, with your feet and with other people. Um, so we really, there's value in the numbers, but the numbers cannot be the goal. Right. 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 So, okay. This is, this is perfect. Um, so let's imagine that in that conversation, you just talked about your three things And now I have one thing that I want to ask of you that you'll do Mm -hmm. over the next eight weeks. And that is that you're going to have a conversation with me in eight weeks about some things that you've read that are, were, you know, important to you, that were influential to you. Um, And as it turns out, we're going to skip forward eight weeks. And as we sit down, you start to talk about Brene Brown's Unlocking Us podcast or Mm -hmm. Mindset by Carol Dweck or Quiet by Susan Cain or The Power of Habit by Charles, Charles uh, Duhigg, uh, or When Elephants Dance by Tess uh, Holthy, I hope I'm saying that right, Heads <laughs> by Harry, Behold the Mini, Blues Hanging by Lois Ann Yamanaka, boy, I love her, and Rolling the R's <laughs> by uh, Zamora Lindmark. So here we are eight weeks later, and you have come to the table with here some things that I've read, and I'm like, my question is, like, what were some cool things that came out of all of that? I know that's huge, but go for it. Um, in eight weeks, I hope to tell you um, my thoughts on the three questions that, that I wanted us to like explore. Um, I also would like to 
um, with the help of those books because I love them. And I, I like those books because they really have a way of like humanizing people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And recognizing that there's so many different kinds of people. And then, and then I want to tell you a story and depends on how much time you have. Let me tell you a story about students. Okay. And I want to tell you about individual students and what I learned about them and what I am learning from them. I want to tell you about how they are people and how, um, what their, what I perceive and what I'm learning when they like reflect with me on our one-on-one -on -one conferences, what they have taken away as people from my class. Um, so let's focus back on mm. students and teachers as human beings. Mm -hmm. And so if, if we skip forward eight weeks and we're actually having that conversation, I have one more question about these books, which is taking two for, oh, well, one podcast and one book, Brene Brown's podcast and Mindset by Carol Dweck. In what ways do Dweck and Brown nourish you, Janica? Sure. Um, Carol Dweck. <laughs> I mean, where do you start, right? <laughs> right, right, right. Um, so, like, the most memorable part of that book to me is uh, there's a section where uh, she talks about. Um, people with zero experience drawing or painting some sort of artsy stuff mm -hmm. and they draw a portrait and it's like stick figures la 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 and then so many weeks into it they draw another portrait and they the difference between the one from the beginning and the one at the end is really drastic mm -hmm. and it and it makes you remember that your brain is a muscle like you are your entire being is a muscle like you can learn anything but you need to be patient with yourself and with other people and be patient with the process of learning um so with mindset um that book is really impacting me because has impacted me because it reminds me that students learning will go as far mm. as I facilitate it and as far as I believe in them. Mm -hmm. So if my belief in them is infinite and, you know, I don't shy away from struggles with them and I don't believe that anything is necessarily too hard. Granted, I need to like have proper scaffolds. Then they can get there. They can be artists in their own definition. Um, Brene Brown's podcast. One of the things that I like about it is that with different topics covered, the overall like feeling that you get is that there is power in the things that you never expected would have power. Mm -hmm. So vulnerability is powerful. It is a driving force. It, it encourages and it heals um, and so I really, it really hits home run for me. Like I need to come to my classroom as a human being, as a person, and I need to talk to my students and interact with them like they are people and not necessarily like this really concrete hierarchy of teacher student. Uh, um, it's really like we're both going to be vulnerable and we are going to be learner, learner. Mm -hmm. And, know. 
And I, one of the things that I like about uh, Brene Brown's podcast is there's always also like this bigger picture. Um, they talk about, um, you know, Gabby Gonzalez's uh, um, new superhero um, that's meditating and so on and so forth. Mm-hmm. Um, they talk about studies where biologists and chemists tackle the same problems and it turns out they're better at solving the other um, problem or the the chemist is really good at solving the biologist's problem and vice versa. Mm -hmm. Um, So there's really this bigger picture of there's, there's more to each of us than meets the eye. Mm -hmm. And we are, um, we have a lot of agency and we have a lot of power even when we don't necessarily have the usual archetypal um, knowledge and skills. Hmm. Wow. And, you know, I, I'm Brene Brown's podcast is called Unlocking Us. And I'm very mm-hmm. struck by what you've just said, that in effect, what you're talking about is that when we come to the classroom with our students, we need to be unlocked rather than locked. Absolutely. We need to put our like walls down, Mm -hmm. you know, and we also have to um, kind of um, unlock in a sense of we have to let go of things that um, that bring us comfort. Like we have to find ways to sit with our discomfort and to sit with our insecurities of like our fears because learning is not neat. Mm-hmm. It's not in a box. It's dynamic and it's loud and it's messy. And we need to be okay with that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, very much so. And, you know, in, in many ways, you know, as a teacher who who believes each year that I'm going to do it the same way that I did it last year, um, that's part of the unlocking process is it's a difficult thing to do. It's very scary and it, you, you become very vulnerable when you step out of a way of doing into a different way of doing. And I think part of what you've been talking about for the last hour plus is that we need to be kind and compassionate as educators with one another and to help each other as we make these moves. Um, Absolutely. Which are, which are difficult Um so, Janica, I, I want to be respectful of your time. Uh, and so we're, we're down to the last question. And this is a little bit of a sort of tie it up, uh, put a bow on, on it question. Um, in one of my recent episodes, I interviewed Chris Baum, who's the co-founder mm-hmm. of the Millennium School in San Francisco. And he's also the founder of Argonaut School. Um, Chris and I talked extensively about how crummy our middle school experiences were. For me, that was, you know, (laughs) almost 50 years ago. So, you know, ugh, uh, I have zero fond memories, Janica, of middle school, which is really sad. Um, So my question to you is, which is a big one, I I, I understand that, but it's kind of a riff on the title of this podcast. What could middle school be? How could we make middle school the joyful and inquiry-based experience kids deserve? You know, what's interesting about middle school, especially at eighth grade, is that like biologically that's when they um, experience a lot of changes, right? Yeah. And I think that ideally the middle school, a middle school, any middle school would be a place where kind of like our students where change is embraced Mm -hmm. um, and where change is welcome and it's a natural occurrence. Um, And also kind of like the way that eighth graders are um, 
passionate, you know, like we as adults, like I don't necessarily always relate to um, like my passions are very different from my eighth graders passions. Mm -hmm. Um, But the fire is there. So ideally, a middle school is one that recognizes where those fires are and keeps igniting it. You know, let's let's not burn out. Let's not um, take away the fire from our students. We need to um, light their fires or keep it going with them. Um, so middle school really has to be like as dynamic as that 13 year old to 14 year old transition is as like fiery, as feisty, as, as unpredictable and as, um, fluid and out of the box as that, that stage in their life is. Mm. So we, we need to honor like where students are at developmentally at eighth grade or like in middle school. Mm. And so we need to create experiences for them. And therein lies the whole thing right there. I, I, when you were when you were responding, I was thinking about button up versus button down. That middle school is not the time to button up and to cinch the tie real tight and, you know, button your coat. It's the time to actually unbutton a couple buttons and, you know, relax a little and and live a little, right? In middle school, we need to let kids live and experience and be joyful and be curious and, and inquiry-based. That's, that's just what it seems like right. it needs to be. It Yes, because... That's actually when the best or the most amount of learning happens is when they're allowed to, when students are allowed to like flourish as this natural curious creature almost. Mm -hmm. Right. (laughs) Right. Yeah. That's fantastic. And, and, you know, my hope, Janica, is that, that we don't see high school as the time where you have to completely button up. Um, that high school is a time to maybe even find a balance between the formal things that you have to do in your life and over the course of your entire life, but also, you know, echoing Brene Brown and Carol Dweck and, you know, a growth mindset and all that, that high school and beyond is there are times when you do want to unbutton a couple buttons and live a little. And, you know, that's, that just seems like an important thing for us, especially right now during this pandemic. Right, right. And I think that we can see that in our communities, um, the things that have helped people in communities are not necessarily like traditional things or um, unexpected things. Like we typically, like Mr. Boxa, who knew that he would like um, create this community-based um technology access for everyone. Um, We always kind of just think, like you said in the beginning, like we think that all of that is um, the school's responsibility. Um, So we really need to think, you know, like what does education look like outside of the box, outside of our classrooms, um, outside of our comfort zones um, Mm -hmm. and who are all the hands that we need and always bring it back to the students. Mm -hmm. What are they going to benefit from in terms of the long run in their life as functioning adults? What do they need? Mm -hmm. Um, And it's really, it's more than high school. It's more than college. If they even want to choose that route. Um, And you know, there's a lot of different ways to go when you're an adult. And so like, no matter what path they take, how can we empower them to follow whatever it is that they want to follow, no matter what that looks like. Right. And it seems like it comes down to the very basic question, what will make kids most likely to succeed? Absolutely. That's it, right? 
So, Janica Breslin, this has been a marvelous conversation, and I really appreciate your time today. I know you've been hard at it as a teacher all day long today, and now you're you're headed off to your family time. So, thank you for being a part of this show, and I wish you and your family, your husband, your kids, uh, good health, and please be safe. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure being here. Thank you. Okay. Wow, that was amazing. Well done. That was fun. I had so Thank much you. fun. I know I'm an <laughs> education geek, but that was a blast. That was an absolute blast. I'm um, so glad. And I I really appreciate your questioning as I am I when I speak, I have a hard time like staying on track. Um so I really appreciate you and that was that was really awesome. I like having those kinds of conversations and mm -hmm. those yeah. should be normalized here at school. The, those, were, those are the kinds of conversations that we should have at our meetings. Yes, agreed, agreed. 17 years in teaching and boy, I could count on one hand the number of times that I had those kinds of discussions in faculty mm -hmm. meetings or, you know, things like that. And so that's, that's what drives me, Janica. That's what mm -hmm. drives me forward with this podcast and everything else that I'm doing is, you know, it's all about these kinds of conversations and I'm just going to do everything I can with the time I've got to be able to make it possible for those to happen. So I, I really appreciate your contribution today. I'm so excited to let Jill know that we've got this episode done. Um, <laughs> it, it, it'll go, she, she made a great choice. Um, it'll go up uh, late Sunday night um, so that it actually, I can say that it releases on Monday and then I do a big social media blast across Facebook, Twitter, um, and LinkedIn. Um, and I'll be letting her know and all of that. And hopefully TFA Hawaii is going to uh, put it in their newsletter and, you know, gotcha. push it out there and all that. So I hope, I hope, gotcha. it, I hope the conversation is a useful tool for you going forward. And please, you know, anything I can do to support you, copies of the book, What School Could Be That I Can Get to You, um, mm -hmm. access to anything, you you just let me know. I'm, I'm in your corner. I would love to support you in any way I can. Thank you. And yeah. thank you for like giving me those resources. I watched your video. It is amazing. Oh, you watched I think, the like, film? You, the... Um, yes, I did. Wow. Um, <laughs> you must have been and, up late. Um, well, it's like the things you live for as a teacher. It's amazing. And I hope that, um, I hope that it, more people watch it and just be inspired. Mm. I think like this pandemic, um, it really has tired a lot of people out and it's not even done yet. Yeah, um, yeah agreed. And I think that one of the things that, that you're, the way, one of the ways that your video has impacted me is it, it really like, it made me feel alive today oh, when I finished it. I'm like, yes, I'm in the right position. I am in the right place at the right time. Oh. And I'm going to keep having a great time with it, both the ups and the downs, and I'm, we're going to do it again tomorrow. Mm, wow, you, you've just made my day. Thank you. It, it only got released yesterday. Um, <laughs> and, you know, there's – thank you. I, I really appreciate it. It was two and a half years of really, really hard work, and it was wow. a lot of ups and downs with Sea Rider Productions and working with kids who did all of the shooting of that video. Um, and so I, I encourage you to take a look at the other videos that are up there. There's mm -hmm. a whole crawl. Those are all videos that Ted and his team have put together over the last six months. And mm -hmm. they're peppered with Hawaii people um, who make their contributions. And so this is like a really special moment. And I think the whole site could be useful. And again, anything that I can do to help with that, uh, you know, if I can ever travel again, I'd love to come back over to Big Island to Kona side. Um, and if, if you ever want to do something together around that, I'm, I'm ready to do it. I'd be happy to do it. Thank you, Josh. Awesome. And, um, um, on my own, I'll remember to thank Jill. Cause, um, I don't know if she told you, but when she first asked me to do this, I was like, no girl. <laughs> Hell no. <laughs> <laughs> I can't be doing this stuff. Yeah. Um, but it really is a good reminder of, um, why we need to 
be visionaries and innovative and and just stay the course as teachers. So yeah. thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, I will let you go. Thank you. I'll be in touch. Um, if, if it's okay, I'm going to use that photo you sent with uh, me with the big paddle as the, the photo for the <laughs> episode. Know? I love that photo. <laughs> I am... I, um, um, I know you've interviewed Shauna Gunnarsson before. Yes, yeah. And then I was telling, so she's like two two doors away from me. And I told her like, oh my gosh, this guy, he like, he needs to be more specific with his questions. He says a favorite pick and I sent him this and it has nothing to do with education. Like, <laughs> I must look like a fool. <laughs> right. Um, I'm like, I don't know what he's going to ask me at the podcast. I don't know where this is going. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, so you're she, kind of a scary guy. She was probably like, there, there, you'll get through it. It'll be okay. Um, you know, there was... The no, she told me, oh. be prepared to cry. Oh, jeez. Like, oh, jeez. Oh, Shauna, don't say that. Yeah. Um, no. You know, there was a moment there. I, it it kind of went by a little bit too quick, so I didn't have a chance to ask about it. But the last question that I asked Shauna was about her um, animal sanctuary. Um, mm -hmm. And that's where she got very emotional. And um, mm -hmm. it was wonderful. Like that was my favorite part of the whole interview uh, was doing all the research that I did about her sanctuary, the, the goat sanctuary. So <laughs> she's, she's a very special person. Um, and how cool it is that the both of you are at that school. How neat. Yeah. 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 I'm glad. glad. We are very lucky to have had her for many years. And she had taken a break and explored other um, lines. Mm -hmm. And then she had come back. We're very, very lucky to have yeah, her. Yeah, yeah, me too. Okay, I'll let you go. Thank you. I'll, uh, I'll Thank be you, in Josh. touch. Okay, take care. Bye. Bye. I am super pleased to note that 41 out of 41 listeners have given our podcast a five-star rating. We appreciate this very much. And thank you for the wonderful written reviews. If you love these episodes with remarkable and innovative educators and education leaders, please give us your own rating and write us a review at your favorite podcast store. The What School Could Be in Hawaii podcast is brought to you by Josh Rapoon Productions. Your host is me, Josh Rapoon. My editor, show consultant, and sound engineer is Daniel Galad at DG Sound Creations. Daniel, an amazing musician, created the original theme music heard in these episodes. To learn more about Daniel or to hire him for your next music gig, see our show notes where you will find his email address and Facebook URL. This series is funded by education change agent Ted Dintersmith, executive producer of the documentary film Most Likely to Succeed, and author of the best-selling book What School Could Be. Send your feedback to mltsinhawaii at gmail.com. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at mltsinhawaii. Finally, please like our Most Likely to Succeed in Hawaii Facebook page and YouTube channel. Please stay safe, healthy, and physically, but not socially distant. And most of all, in the wake of our national election, bring kindness and compassion into the world. See you soon.